The Jewish feast of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, is a time to think about new beginnings. One of my favorite Jewish prayers, which is said on the Jewish New Year, which falls this year, by the way, on the evening of September 25th and concludes at sundown on September 27th. The prayer is called the Shehechianu, which literally means that we are alive. So let me recite it for you. So here it is in Hebrew, so you can practice your Hebrew along with me. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu, Bekiyamanu, Behigianu, Mazman Hazeh. And in English, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive and sustained us and brought us to this season. According to Jewish tradition, this prayer is said whenever we enter a new season, a holiday, a birth, a new house, a new job, a new marriage. It's a prayer of gratitude to God for enabling us to enter a new season or time of life. It's a reminder to thank God for his faithfulness after going through something difficult. We stop, we reflect, and express our gratitude to God for his love and faithfulness. I have many reasons to say this prayer at this very moment. As Jewish people around the globe begin a new year, which according to the Jewish calendar is year 5783, 5783. We've been around a while as a Jewish people. We've passed through great difficulties over the last several years. We've experienced social, political, health crises, a long and now protracted war in Ukraine, a growing intensity of terrorist attacks in Israel, just to name a few. And in the midst of these global and worldwide challenges, you might be going through a personal wilderness of financial hardship, declining health, or a variety of family struggles. This life and our experience in a fallen world may easily be compared to the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel. It's filled with both joy and suffering. Yet we've made it by the grace of God. You're watching this video, which in itself is a great sign. It's good news. But if you're like me, you're also ready for a new start. And His mercies are new every morning, every day, every year. He's unchanging in his love and grace and ready to forgive and to bless and to God. He is the God of new beginnings. Lately, I've been reading Deuteronomy chapters uh, 7 through 9, and I was just struck by some of the life lessons the ancient Israelites learned through their desert wanderings found in chapter 8. We know from this chapter that hard times are not always thrust upon us because of our sin and disobedience. Sometimes it is, for sure. Yet often, the Lord leads us through the wilderness to help us grow in grace. We didn't do anything wrong, but he disciplines the ones he loves. I want to highlight three lessons I've learned through Deuteronomy chapter 8 and my experiences these past couple of years, and hopefully this will encourage your soul as together we enter this new year with gratitude to God for his love and care. First lesson. God leads us into the wilderness of life to shape our character. Many or maybe most of our most valuable lessons come through experiencing hard times, not good times. However, most often we only discover these lessons upon reflection. Once the struggles and difficulties are over, we have time to think. Clearly Moses was calling upon the Jewish people in Deuteronomy chapter 8 to reflect and learn from their 40 years of wilderness wanderings before they entered the blessings of the promised land. In verse two, Moses wrote, you shall remember the way in which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You see, sometimes the difficult challenges we face are gifts from God, and they're designed by God for us to help us better understand what's in the depths of our own hearts. We learn more about God and more about ourselves during the hard times. Don't you find that to be true? Moses' use of the word ana, the Hebrew word which means humble, in verse 2 caught my attention. It's the very same Hebrew term used in Leviticus 23 verse 27 
which says, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls, anav, and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You see, this humbling of oneself was a reminder to Israel to completely rely upon God for everything. Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, willingly chose to humble himself and experience affliction for a redemptive purpose. He received what we should have received, and we received what he should have received. Isaiah put it this way in chapter 53, Surely our griefs he bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Isaiah, in this text, uses the same word for humble, anav, used in Deuteronomy 8 and Leviticus 23. Afflictions and suffering are not always bad from God's perspective. He often allows or even enables or causes these experiences to come into our lives for our benefit. He uses difficulties to purify our souls. And when we understand his purposes for our suffering, it can lead to greater joy and a more powerful sense of his presence with us in the midst of the wilderness of this life. The difficult experiences we go through help us identify with Jesus, with Yeshua, who went through great suffering to identify with us. In fact, in the New Testament, his brother, James, wrote, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be complete and perfect, lacking in nothing. That's James 1, verses 2 through 4. The second lesson we can learn from the experience of the Israelites in the wilderness is that God is sovereign and uses the trials of life to purify our souls and for Jesus followers like you and me to make us more like our Savior. God uses wars and seasons of serious illness and even pandemics in the lives of Jesus' followers to help us love him and to help us love others even more. This was true of Jesus, wasn't it? The writer of Hebrews tells us, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Therefore, and I love this, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, atonement, for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he was suffering, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. That's Hebrews 2.10 and verses 17 through 18. Finally, we learn that we can trust him fully to protect and provide for us in both good times and bad. Moses points out the ways that God cared for the Jewish people during the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, and that he will do the same once they cross the Jordan and enter the promised land. We also know that he will care for us in the same way. Moses reiterates in chapter 8, You shall remember all the ways which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know. Nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And he concludes, which I, I just love, your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You made it through wonderfully, even though it was a difficult time. Deuteronomy 8 verses two through four. Dear friend, I am amazed at how God has cared for chosen people these last few years. Thousands have heard the gospel. Our staff grew, our finances grew. He fed us a little bit too much. 
And though there were moments when we thought we might wear out, he didn't allow it. As we reflect today on what God has done for us in the wilderness, we are able to rejoice knowing that he takes care of us and uses seemingly bad experiences to help us grow in our faith. You know, Moses offered a final warning to the children of Israel that good times can turn out badly if we allow ourselves to grow comfortable in this world, which is not our true home, is it? And we forget about the Lord. His good promises assure us of a bright future. He calls us to remain faithful during the hard times, to grow in faith, and to learn to be totally dependent upon Him. If we have nothing else to depend upon, we must depend upon Him. These are lessons we would never be able to learn if everything was going well. Moses, the great leader of Israel, wrote, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His ordinance and His, and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today, Deuteronomy 8, 11. We learn some of life's most important lessons in the darkness, but we must continue to apply them in the light. What a joy it is to look at all God did for the Israelites in the wilderness, my ancestors, your spiritual forefathers, and what he's done for us during the difficult moments he allows us to experience today. Let's remember that the same God who led the Israelites through the wilderness is the God who loves us, who sent his son to die for our sins, and provides all we need to walk through the wilderness of this life with hope and joy. We too will make it to the land of promise because he is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. How great is thy faithfulness. May I offer you a word of blessing? It's the traditional Jewish New Year's greeting. It goes like this. Lashana tova tikatevu. It means, may you be inscribed for a good year. Based upon the tradition that God inscribes us in the Book of Life, at the end of the Day of Atonement, 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, because of our fruitful repentance during Rosh Hashanah and the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which are called the 10 Days of Repentance. Yet as followers of Jesus the Messiah, we know, and let me make it very clear, that repentance does not save. We are only saved through His finished work at Calvary, and because of his sacrificial death on our behalf, our names have been inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life. So I pray you will have a good and sweet year and that you would share this glorious message of redemption. Repentance is a door, but redemption through the death of Yeshua is the pathway that God has created for us to know him personally. We know that Jesus the Messiah is the one who saves us, who died for us. And it is because of him that our names can be inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life. So again, Happy New Year. And please remember to share this wonderful message with your Jewish friends and neighbors. God bless you and Shalom.